Experts warn that a pandemic of superbugs will dwarf coronavirus if action isn't taken. Superbugs already kill 700,000 per year, and the UN has called them an existential threat. But new antibiotics aren't being developed because they aren't profitable. The healthcare business has other targets, weakening our resistance further. One superbug infection shows what we could face and how we might survive. When Tom started vomiting during a holiday in Egypt, he thought it was food poisoning. A CT scan showed an abscess in his gut nearly the size of a football. After being flown to Frankfurt, he started hallucinating and seeing hieroglyphs on the walls before falling into a coma. The doctor said it was the worst infection in the world, which had closed down hospitals in Germany. After all antibiotics had failed, the doctors decided that surgically removing the infection was too risky, as if it got into his bloodstream, he would go into septic shock, an extreme immune response. Instead, the doctors tried removing the fluid by poking five drains into his abdomen. Tom was hallucinating that he had been wandering the desert for years. When one of the drains slipped, it dumped the infection into his bloodstream and he went into septic shock. Tom's wife, Stephanie, overheard a doctor asking if anyone had told her that he was going to die. She held his hand with her gloved hand and said, Honey, the doctors don't have anything left. All these antibiotics are useless. So if you want to live, please squeeze my hand and I will leave no stone unturned. After a while, Tom squeezed her hand. The couple were both scientists, having met through their work in AIDS research. Steph turned to PubMed, a medical search engine, and read about bacteriophage therapy. Phages inject bacteria and then multiply until their hosts explode. There are more phages on Earth than all other organisms combined, and they kill 40% of the bacteria in the ocean every day. Steph and one of Tom's physicians got FDA approval for the experimental treatment that they then had to find the right kind of phage. A doctor turned his lab into a search operation, requesting phages from around the world to be tested against Tom's bacteria. Steph described it as a true global village to rescue one man. Tom's lungs and kidneys were failing, and he may have been just hours from dying. Phage cocktails were injected into Tom's abdomen, then his bloodstream, an extremely rare and risky procedure. Tom gradually recovered, relearning how to walk and talk. Steph received calls from people around the world who had family members dying from superbug infections. A British teenager was given a 1% chance of survival, but thanks to a genetically modified phage cocktail, she recovered. Phages are one potential defence against superbugs, but a lot of research is needed to explore widestream use. They are grown in bacteria, and if any of the dead bacteria remain, it can cause a deadly immune response. And each type of phage can only infect a few species of bacteria, so doctors would need to know the exact bacteria and have the right phages available. Without research and new antibiotics, many procedures will become too dangerous, and neonatal sepsis, a common condition, will become untreatable. But the antibiotics we need aren't coming because they aren't profitable. Developing one costs around $1.5 billion. At the same time, U.S. agriculture, a major source of superbugs, receives $20 billion in annual subsidies. Factory farms use huge volumes of antibiotics, breeding antibiotic-resistant bacteria which can spread to humans. We aren't just ignoring the next pandemic. 
we're heavily funding it. Burgers are an essential public service, but healthcare requires profit. Antibiotics are typically only prescribed for a week or two, so they don't make enough money. Major drug companies have dropped out, instead developing more profitable drugs where prices can be increased, and the search for profit is crippling the healthcare systems that we'll need to deal with the threat. In the US, thousands die each year from lack of insurance, while health company bosses earn huge salaries. One took a billion dollar retirement package. And the NHS could soon be in their hands, the front line in a stealthy global battle. It costs around $10,000 to give birth in the US, $20,000 in New York, and even those with health insurance pay around $4,000. Complicated births can cost far more. In the UK, it's a free service, and the maternal death rate is much lower. Medical bills are the top cause of bankruptcy in the US, and in most cases, the people have health insurance but still lose their homes. It's not left versus right. Research found that satisfied patients were more likely to die because they were over-prescribed. And physicians reported that unnecessary prescriptions and procedures were common. In a poll, 70% of physicians said it was more likely when profit was involved. Most Americans want universal health care, and the NHS stands alongside firefighters as the UK's most treasured institutions. But our least popular group has a plan for it. The NHS was born from the selfless acts of World War II and the sense of service to others. Children no longer died needlessly, and the elderly stopped killing themselves to avoid burdening their families. This new health service will be organized on a national scale as a public responsibility. Now suppose, just suppose, you fall off your bike. Suppose your brakes give out. You'd be carted off in an ambulance, which might cost a couple of quid. And then you'd have to pay the hospital too. The new health service would cover all this. Senior doctors ran medical departments and matrons ran wards, so admin costs were extremely low. But business, banks and their friends in government began quietly privatising what they could. First, NHS kitchens and cleaners were privatised, and without medical staff in charge of cleaning, hospital caught infections rose. Free optician and dental care was cut back and fees were introduced. A huge number of managers was hired, taking over from medical experts and selling hospitals to private companies to be bought back at several times the price. 11 billion pounds was borrowed, with 88 billion pounds to be repaid. Admin costs rose dramatically, but are still far lower than in the US. Over 40 years, while the number of doctors in the US doubled, the number of administrators increased 30 times. In fact, one of the barriers to universal health care is the number of pointless admin jobs that would be lost. Though skills can sometimes be transferred, fraud is rife in US healthcare. When Health Corporation of America was investigated for overbilling the government, paying kickbacks to doctors, and falsifying records, it paid over $2 billion to settle the case. A former health insurance executive describes how treatment is denied to boost profits. A lot of the ones that are denied are the ones that cost the most money or the treatment costs the most money. It could be cancer care. It could be um, uh, a liver transplant. In the UK, high-risk patients are kept in hospital. But in the US, profit demands the opposite. I do hear about this in terms of maternity care because crises happen very quickly and they, they can be lethal. 
But in the United States, as soon as they're in and they're thought to be, by the doctor, to be at risk, the insurance rings up and says, you've got to send this woman home. So they're deciding, not the doctor. America has the highest number of maternal deaths of any developed country. Regardless, the UK government hired US corporations to advise on running the NHS and to carry out operations at higher costs. But then it also hired this guy. In just a few years' time, it will become the biggest and most successful Peppa Pig world. Now, I think that is pure genius, don't you, Peppa Pig? But seriously, when one company took over cataract surgery for a hospital, 50% of patients suffered complications and many were left with impaired vision. Behind the scenes, the same companies helped write a 2012 health law abolishing the government's legal duty to provide health care. Over 200 parliamentarians with financial links to private health voted on the act. A former CEO of the world's largest private health insurance corporation was put in charge of the NHS. And a former boss of Centene's UK subsidiary is now expert advisor for NHS transformation. The result of all the transformation so far? Emergency wait times are the worst since records began. Ambulance response times for heart attacks and strokes are taking three times longer than they should. It's not COVID, it's a pre-existing condition. Ambulances are queuing up with no hospital staff to hand patients to. One person died from a heart attack after spending five hours in an ambulance outside a hospital. 4,519 deaths have been linked to long wait times over the past year. And those wait times are growing rapidly. The record six million people are on NHS waiting lists. There are half the number of hospital beds in the NHS compared to 30 years ago. And the UK has far fewer doctors and nurses than Germany or France. Brexit intensified the problem with a 90% drop in the number of nurses from Europe. And a shortage of nurses has been found to increase the rate of patient deaths from all causes. There are 39,000 vacancies for nurses in England and the NHS is paying up to £7,000 for each vacant post to try to recruit more from countries like India and the Philippines. Those countries have their own shortages, often more severe, and taking their nurses has devastating consequences. Covid patients died, despite new ventilators, because there were no staff to operate the machines. NHS funding was historically low leading up to the pandemic. After creating a staffing crisis, Johnson's government promised 50,000 more nurses during the election, but he later explained that he meant 31,000 new nurses. And the funding announced points to far lower numbers. The hardest problem is finding the nurses, with exhausted staff earning less than they were 10 years ago. Less staff means patient care is compromised, and as healthcare workers, that breaks our heart. When we're offering care, that is not the best we can offer. Just because the resources we're being provided by the government are too short, it breaks our heart. We take that home with us. The NHS has lost its top spot in international healthcare rankings due to long waits and lack of investment. But the US remains by far the worst rated system, despite spending the most on care. And many in the US have to queue up overnight, often to be turned away before reaching help. They open the parking lot at midnight, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, they begin handing out numbers to the individuals in the car. Pretty much everyone that I've talked to has had a very similar situation to mine, where they are insured, but the insurance doesn't cover certain services. It's a great little young guy who was a sixth grader in school. And he got a pair of glasses, and he was just jubilant. He said, well, how long has it been since you've had a new pair of glasses? He says, I haven't been able to read for the last three years. You know, we're better than that.
But in the UK, the next big step is approaching. A new bill that will create 42 groups to manage funding. Crucially, private providers will not be barred from these groups. These corporations will be given legal footing to take control of the budgets. In particular, the company United Health. That's the same United Health that awarded its CEO a billion dollar package, 40,000 times the salary of a new UK nurse. But the sense of service to others still drives the NHS. Despite infamously difficult workloads, 21,000 people signed up to train as nurses in England this year, 2,000 more than last year. Many were inspired to join by our heroes during the pandemic. On the day the NHS was born, its first patient, a 13-year-old girl, was told that it was the most civilized step any country had ever taken. Six decades later, it's still treasured, but it's under siege. Please, sign the petition to reverse NHS privatization. The link's below. Suppose your wife falls ill suddenly. But my woman never is ill. Strong as a blooming horse she is. Hmm, we mothers can't afford to be ill. I'm not insured. 